When someone brings up the topic of witches in the Western world, many people's minds may go to Halloween, broomsticks, tall black pointy hats, or dark magic and hexes being cast on some poor soul. But the truth is, witches were very real, or at least that's what the church wanted you to believe. Salem, Massachusetts, for example, may bring to mind for many the Salem Witch Trials, a brutal year-long period of mass hysteria and persecution in the English colonies that resulted in over 200 villagers being accused of witchcraft, wherein around 20 of the accused were ultimately executed by hanging. This paranoia and the resulting chaos of the trials were largely caused by fervent Puritan beliefs and social tensions resulting from the English King William's War on France and the New World. And it wasn't until 1957, over 250 years later, that the state of Massachusetts issued a formal apology to the families accused of witchcraft. While Salem may be the most memorable of the witch trials, at least in the United States, the witch hunting craze certainly did not begin and end there. In fact, witch hunts were conducted in Europe starting in the mid-15th century. Over 300 years, tens of thousands were persecuted and many executed for what was believed at the time to be the devil sowing hatred and malcontent within early modern European communities. Out of all the countries where witch trials were prominent, including Spain, England, Italy, and Switzerland, the region of South Germany was a particular hotspot for witch hunts, thought to account for a third or even half of all witch prosecutions in Europe, and perhaps even half of all executions to have been carried out on those persecuted. Of these trials in South Germany, there was one location where the witch hysteria reached unprecedented heights. These were the Würzburg Witch Trials, a true horror in history. In order to understand the terror early modern Europeans faced from the perceived existence of witches, we would first need to understand the religious and social issues of early modern Europe, which of course includes Germany. Up until the early 1500s, the Western Church was solely Roman Catholic, and while many Christians continue to see the church as a place for spiritual comfort, others saw it as having too much involvement in the political realm, with its hands in too many pockets. This led such prominent German figures as Martin Luther to lose confidence in the Roman Catholic Church, and universally decry what they viewed as a perversion of the church's doctrine regarding redemption and grace. So proceeded what would be called the Protestant Reformation, wherein the church split into two denominations, the Protestants and the Catholics. What coincided from this was a fierce schism of ideals and beliefs within the Western Church that escalated tensions in German society and beyond. But because Germany was ground zero for the Reformation, there the embers of dissonance burned brightest, and so began what was essentially a human land grab by religious leaders. Protestants and Catholics alike needed to demonstrate their strength and prove to the other that their denomination provided the best protection against the devil. So while most religious figures refused to acknowledge accusations, or even consider the existence of witches during the medieval period of Europe. These continued accusations in the early 16th century by everyday citizens towards their fellow community members presented a major opportunity to leaders of faith looking to retain or acquire new followers for their respectful flock. And to further complicate matters, the Würzburg Witch Trials took place during the Thirty Years' War, which spanned from 1618 to 1648, when Roman Catholic Emperor Ferdinand II of Bohemia was deposed from the throne and supplanted by the Protestant Frederick V of the Palatinate, effectively influencing the state of affairs within Germany, as the initially internal dynastic conflict spread across the continent because of its strategic importance to other rulers. So with the church and state heavily involved with feeding into the German population's superstitions and paranoia over whether or not their next door neighbor was working for the devil, who exactly proceeded over the initiation of the trials? Both the church and state, technically speaking, for in 741 AD, the Catholic Church established the territory of Würzburg as a diocese, or a district that falls under pastoral control by a bishop of the church, known as a bishopric, a figure tasked with both theological and political duties. The prince bishop who sparked the beginnings of Würzburg's witch trials was Julius Ector von Mespelbrunn, a devout Catholic who was involved with the Counter-Reformation, a major Catholic pushback against the Protestants, resulting in further upheaval and turmoil across the European continent including rising tensions and accusations of sorcery and devil-worshipping. Von Mespelbrunn took it upon himself to order isolated witch trials and executions in the years leading up to those taking place in and around Würzburg. At the outbreak of the Thirty Years' War in 1618, the persecutions and trials abruptly ceased, and for a time, German citizens could rest a little easier 
without worrying whether or not they were next to be burning on the pyre or hanging from the rope. It was not until 1626, when a frost killed many crops in the Würzburg territory, that its citizens began pointing fingers again, not towards natural occurrences, but towards each other. And with the Prince Bishop von Nussbrunn having passed away, his nephew, Philip Adolf von Ehrenberg, took up his uncle's place. Von Ehrenberg was a proud Catholic and staunch supporter of the Counter-Reformation, with intent to convert all of his territories to Catholicism and root out any remaining Protestant beliefs with an iron fist. So when rumors of witchcraft began to spin wildly through Würzburg's lands once again, von Ehrenberg ordered an immediate investigation. So began what would come to be known as one of the largest witch trials in Europe's history. Like many witch hunts that came before and went on to occur after, the investigations into witchcraft in Würzburg started at the lowest ends of the economic caste, with working class women being the primary targets for arrests and interrogations. But what differentiates von Ehrenberg's special investigative witch commission and their interrogation methods from other witch trials in and outside of Germany was the complete dismissal of the Constitutio Criminalis Carolina, an important statute of German laws that originated all the way back to the humanistic school of law created by the Romans. Within these laws, ratified by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V in 1532, there are certain conditions set for interrogation and torture methods when it comes to the persecution of someone for sorcery, one of which being that there can be no further instances of torture after the initial occurrence. However, von Ehrenberg's Witch Commission concocted a sort of judicial loophole, positioning that any further sessions of torture on suspected defendants were simply continuations of the initial procedure, allowing for multiple experiences of trauma the victims were made to endure. Furthermore, as mandated in the Carolina, the application of pain and physical harm on a defendant for the charge of sorcery was intended only to take place should simple verbal questioning of a suspect not render conclusive answers regarding the charges. Yet in order to force suspected witches into confessing and naming accomplices, the Witch Commission regularly employed brutally vicious means of gathering such evidence. In addition to authorities restraining from the act of torture unless absolutely necessary, the Carolina also mandated that any confessions gained resulting from torture methods should only be transcribed after the torture had concluded. This was in order to prevent a fabricated confession being drawn out from someone under duress. Unfortunately, for the citizens of Würzburg, von Ehrenberg's witch hunters showed little mercy during their interrogations, conducting barbaric acts of violence upon the accused with the intent of coercing them into breaking. The methods of torture interrogators used on suspected witches varied in severity, yet all were horrendous in nature. When questioning or examination of the suspect's naked body for witch marks failed to prove innocence or guilt, acts of violence became the next step in rendering a verdict in the case. Milder forms of torture may have included flogging, whipping, or submerging the person in an ice bath. However, one of the most common torture methods was that of strapado, or the lifting of the person by ropes tied around their wrists and then allowing the person to fall the length of the rope, wherein the individual stopped with a sudden jerk, leading to great strain and pain in the victim's shoulders, with the possibility of even causing dislocation of the shoulders from their sockets. A variation on strapado was squazation, or having the person's arms tied behind their back, with a heavy weight fastened to their feet, before they were lifted up by their arms, again causing great pain and injury, as they were jerked up and down, with the hope of the suspect confessing to the crimes in question. Thumbscrews, or thumpkins as they were often called, was another excruciating torture method used on suspected witches and sorcerers. A small vice-like mechanism, the victim's thumb or big toe was placed inside where a protruding stud would rest over the thumb or toenail. A key would then be turned, ever tighter, the stud crushing the thumb or toe, causing the bones and nails to break. Some thumbscrews were even modified to include a spiked stud that would burrow into the soft flesh of the nail bed while others included numerous studs in order to damage multiple digits at the same time. Other forms of slow compressing tortures were also used, such as the Spanish boot, a metal casing applied around the calf and foot where wooden or iron wedges were hammered in between the boot and the flesh, causing fracturing of the bones. Variations of this device also existed, such as metal boots with the interior covered in teeth or rivets that would be tightened around the leg until the bones would break. Yet another torture method that pulled, like strapado, rather than pushed, like thumbscrews or the Spanish boot, was the rack, a wooden frame the victim would be laid across with their wrists and ankles fastened before a lever device would be operated, 
a pulley system stretching the person in opposite directions before the tendons, ligaments, and joints would pop and crack, followed by the joints separating entirely. Tortures that led to more immediate pain and severe physical trauma were more simplistic acts such as torch burning, hot lime water baths to burn the flesh, and other scalding applications such as placing the person's foot in a large metal or leather boot and then pouring in boiling water or molten lead. While not all of these torture methods, excluding those of strapado, vices such as the Spanish boot and thumbscrews, are known to have been used in the Würzburg witch trials specifically, they are all known torture routines that were utilized in early modern European witch trials during the same time. However, the torture in Würzburg of suspected witches was so severe that what began as a persecution of low-income working women expanded as the interrogators pressed for more information, including named accomplices. Soon, the investigations began to climb up the social ladder, as not only low-income men and women were now targeted, but also those in the upper classes as well, including members of the church and the clerical elite. Even Prince Bishop Philip von Ehrenberg's own nephew, Ernst, was arrested and executed for witchcraft. The authorities went so far as to arresting, torturing, and executing children as young as three years old. These unprecedented events of the witch hunt unfolding in and around Würzburg goes back to the torture chambers where the witch commission's interrogators acted indiscriminately in gathering names to add on their list of suspects. Friedrich Spee, a Jesuit priest and one of the earliest critics of the witch trials, acted as a confessor during many sessions of torture and executions. The proceedings were so unscrupulous and Spee was so disturbed by what he experienced. His hair prematurely whitened, and his trust in the validity of the trials irrevocably faltered. While the witch trials during the 16th and 17th centuries took place across many countries in Europe and in some locations of the English colonies, the approach to dispatching the condemned differed. In English-speaking countries such as England and the colonies, witchcraft was considered a felonious crime. In these cases, the punishment was typically death by hanging. However, in the countries of Europe, such as the regions where a secular war was taking place between Protestants and Catholics, witchcraft was thus considered a crime of secular nature, and in these cases, the punishment was death by fire. A few theories exist for why people who were sentenced to death for witchcraft met their end at the stake. One of these is the fact that those who were convicted of heresy were simply burned for that very reason. Losing one's life to fire may have been seen as a purifying act by the church, for the condemned soul was cleansed by the fire, and in a way, the church may have felt that they were offering a sort of mercy. Another theory suggests that, again, for religious reasons, some Christians may have believed in the body's resurrection in the afterlife following death, and total immolation of the body, therefore, would not allow this to take place as a sort of eternal punishment since the person was viewed as a heretic. Yet another theory is based on a more traditionally superstitious merit. If a person's body was left behind after their soul departed, there may have existed a fear that other witches may come and collect parts of the body to use in the performance of black magic. Whatever the case, many who were executed for witchcraft in and around Würzburg were burned alive at the stake in view of all to see. Whether they were men, women, working class, noble of birth, figureheads of the church, or even orphan children, they met their end in the fire. The arrests and executions continued to spread out of control to the point where even vagrants who were passing through Würzburg and could not provide a satisfactory excuse for why they were there, were taken, tortured, and burned just the same. And as the years went on, the primary demographic for those accused and executed would occasionally shift solely to the male population. The execution pyres would continue to burn throughout Würzburg, darkening the skies with smoke, when in late summer 1629, the Chancellor to the Prince Bishop wrote to a friend describing the miserable state of affairs the whole operation had become. He would go on in detail in his letter, suggesting that no longer was anyone safe, with people of all stations and social standings in danger of finding themselves arrested for witchcraft within the hour. From highly learned men in the educational and ecclesiastical systems, thought of by their peers in the highest regard, to women viewed as having possessed the utmost modesty and purity, and children as young as three and four years of age, it mattered not. Up to a third of the entire city of Würzburg was being prosecuted for witchcraft. In the city and territory surrounding it, a veritable reign of terror had befallen the people, where you or a loved one could be next, burning at the stake. Because Philip von Ehrenberg's witch hunt was so indiscriminate, condemning many important figures in Würzburg's government and church, a number of relatives to those accused were able to use their influential connections to escape the city and its territories 
and began to write letters of protestation against the trials to von Ehrenberg's superiors. These letters condemned the trials for their chaotic nature and were able to find their way to decisive figures such as the Pope and Emperor Ferdinand II himself. It wasn't long before enough complaints against von Ehrenberg were heard that the Imperial Chamber Court in Speyer, Germany issued a public denunciation of the Würzburg Witch Trials in 1630. In July 1631, the Prince Bishop Philip von Ehrenberg died, having inherited his uncle Julius Ector von Mespelbrunn's religious crusade against the Protestant Reformation. Von Ehrenberg took the matter to unspeakable heights, and following his death, Swedish King Gustavus Adolphus rode his army into Würzburg, occupying the territories while he was campaigning across Germany in support of the Protestants during the Thirty Years' War. Upon the king's arrival, the Würzburg witch trials finally came to a conclusive end. In regards to the overall toll the trials took on Würzburg citizens, an approximate figure can never be obtained, as there is little in the way of surviving written documentation from the time. However, what has been preserved states that an estimated 219 executions took place within the city itself, having been conducted in the city center. A further 900 executions are written to have taken place in the surrounding areas of the city, and in addition, many people subjugated to torture and imprisonment are known to have died in custody of von Ehrenberg's witch commission likely either due to starvation, disease, or injury sustained during the interrogations. Though according to contemporary sources, there were simply so many burnings taking place that it wasn't possible to account for all, suggesting that the human toll of the Würzburg Witch Trials may have been much greater. For a time after Würzburg's Witch Trials ended, Nearby cities such as Wertheim and Mergentheim followed the same indiscriminate methods conducted in Würzburg, the methods becoming so synonymous with their origin, they earned a notorious description, Würzburgish work. However, people continued to speak up against witch trials and witch hunts in general. In fact, Friedrich Spee, whom we learned of earlier, went so far as to develop and anonymously publish his very own literature that advocated for legal reform and, in a sense, the complete abolishment of torture used in legal proceedings. This was the Cascio Criminalis. In the text, Spee called for accused persons to be provided a lawyer and legal defense, especially when it came to the charges of witchcraft being such a serious crime. Spee went on to emphasize the futility of torture to be used in investigations, as the defendant would confess to anything in order to make the torture stop. He also advocated for more protective rights of women, who he witnessed on multiple occasions being sexually assaulted when interrogators stripped them and performed full-body searches for evidence such as witch marks. To conclude, Spee essentially proclaimed that witch hunts and their subsequent trials were nothing more than black holes of pain and misery, given that with each person denunciated, it was expected of them to in turn denunciate others in their community, thereby beginning a terrible cycle which could only end in everyone eventually burning at the stake. Fortunately, Spee's Cascio Criminalis was well received and had a direct role in helping to end Europe's witch hunts. He attempted to publish it anonymously as a so-called Roman theologian. However, it didn't take long for the writings to be attributed back to the Jesuit priest. And so Spee was looked back on favorably in history as a progressive leader in the abolishment of witch trials in Europe. The Würzburg witch trials became some of the largest mass trials and mass executions in European history. And while sporadic witch trials continued to crop up over the years in 17th century Europe, they saw a steep decline by 1650. The Thirty Years' War finally concluded with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, ending decades of religious turmoil on the continent. By the year 1700, witch hunts and trials had been nearly phased out as the early modern era continued to modernize. And while Würzburg and the whole of Europe alike have tucked the archaic witch trials of their past far back into one of the many dark corners of history, the trials still remain a regrettable black spot in their society. As was the case with the state of Massachusetts' long-neglected apology to the descended families of the Salem Witch Trial victims, Germany's church too rested on recompense for 400 years, when in 2020, following multiple other apologetic statements from cities across Germany since 2011, a German Catholic church in Bavaria's city of Eckstadt publicly denounced the witch trials as a bleeding wound in the church's history. While such a statement unfortunately cannot harken back through the ages to fall on the ears of those most immediately affected by the trials, it's comforting to know that such voices of reason as Friedrich Spies were around to push for much-needed change in their communities when it came to the safety and well-being of their fellow citizens. 
for as a whole, the nearly 300-year period of witch trials across Europe led to an estimated 60,000 deaths as a result. And because in the midst of all that death, fear, and injustice, a little town in South Germany managed to cast one of the darkest shadows over Europe during that time, making the Würzburg Witch Trials a true horror in history. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more videos like this one. Thanks for watching Horrors in History.